Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Vicky Nash. I am Deputy Director and Senior Policy Fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford. And I'm really delighted to welcome you all to our hour long webinar this afternoon, um, which is going to be presented by a very dear friend of the OII. Our speaker today is Professor Yorick Wilkes. He's Professor of Artificial Intelligence at uh, Sheffield University, Visiting Professor of Artificial Intelligence at Gresham College. But perhaps most importantly for me, he was one of our earliest academic uh, um, friends at the OII. He joined us as a visiting fellow in 2003 and has been with us in various guises over the years. He's going to speak to us today on the topic of artificial intelligence and religious belief, um, which I think is just the perfect topic for our time. Something will take my mind off all the other terrible things that are happening today. Um, as usual, we'll have a speaker for about half an hour and then those of you that are watching will have a chance to ask questions. If you can do this by typing your question into the Q&A section, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen, uh, and I will take questions as they appear in chronological order once Yorick has spoken. Um, please don't use the chat function. I think with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to our illustrious speaker. Um, so Yorick, over to you. Thanks for coming today. Thank you, Vicky. I guess they can hear me. I'm just trying to share my screen. Yeah. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, artificial intelligence and religion. Um, two topics, I think, rarely brought together, if ever. There, there is a literature, but it's very tiny. Um, and I will try to um, bring out It'll be, it'll be basically a sort of survey of things going on in different places that you might not be aware of. I have no particular line to sell, um, but I, I found some great curiosities, and I, I think some of them may interest you. Look at this. I mean, this is a Tibetan prayer wheel turned by a stream somewhere in the Himalayas, um, a sort of mechanical religious activity that's been going on for a very long time. Not exactly artificial intelligence, but uh, quite something. I mean... Uh, I'm told there are lots of these in Tibet praying away all the time. What have they talked about? I'm going to go back to cybernetics, which is the old embarrassing relative of AI, which sort of got pushed up into the attic when AI began to flex its muscles. And I'll talk a bit about two pioneers of cybernetics, Wiener and Beer. I'll say a word about the traditional theology of omniscience, knowing everything, which is very cl close to the heart of traditional artificial intelligence. And then three sections on what I'm calling romantic visions of machines as perfect, um, making human-like things, augmenting humans, and making God machines. Uh, you, you can't tell immediately what those are. You could probably guess. Um, and the last section is slightly more, is slightly duller, automating religious practice. Um, Always remember that great intellects are full of surprises. Um, here's a bit of Wittgenstein, and you can't go wrong starting with Wittgenstein. I'm not a religious man, but I cannot help seeing every problem from a religious point of view, he said. Not sure what he meant. Bayes, as you probably know, is the cleric whose theorem underlies virtually all of machine learning, which is the dominant paradigm of um, artificial intelligence at the moment. What's so odd is that Bayes, a cleric, uh, thought up his theorem so as to defend miracles against Hume's arguments against them. That's a surprise, isn't it? And similarly with Gödel, arguably the greatest logician of the last century, spent his last years at Princeton on ontological proofs of God's existence. Um, these are all slightly sort of surprising deviations by outstanding intellects. Dennett, who is the most um, active and aggressive atheist of our time, apart from our own Richard Dawkins, has written of his puzzlement at the survival of religious belief for Darwinists like himself. How can it have survival value, he asks himself. Cybernetics and artificial intelligence. Cybernetics, which had its heyday in the 50s and 60s, was a system of using continuous mathematics, that's to say, not digital um, discrete mathematics. It was against representations of things. It used what was called analog computing, that's to say not digital machines, but machines based on other material principles. It was interested above all in modeling animals and insects. Um, the, it was very much addicted to models based on brains and, and networks. And the, its key notions were feedback and learning. One of those dramatic demonstrations of cybernetics in Britain was Grey Walter's tortoises that went about a room, a bit like the sort of modern automatic vacuum cleaners, which are um, Roomba, which in a way are Grey Walter's tortoises come back, except they clean as they go. Uh, Grey Walter's tortoises went about a room seeking electric plugs to plug themselves in and keep going. Um, it all fell out of favour and was, you might say, banished to the attic by AI. AI, traditional symbolic AI, which flourished 50 to 90, was based 
quite the opposite, was based on representations, on logic, digital hardware. John McCarthy, the great Stanford AI man, said that intelligence was independent of brains, animals, humans. Intelligence was what AI studied. It was non-statistical. It was non-continuous mathematics. But this in its turn has declined as machine learning came back and rose again in the 1990s and has become the dominant paradigm. Traditional symbolic AI, which is the tradition I was brought up in, has been very much pushed into the background now, although it still survives. Some think it will come back. Fashion comes back, as you know, in all subjects, including the sciences. In cybernetics, the word almost vanished by the 1980s. It was the old, discredited AI, ancestor of AI, locked in the attic and forgotten. And now it's out of the attic and among us again with machine learning, which has many of its features. Um, also, you have to remember, cybernetics was awfully influential in what's sometimes called continental thought. And French thinkers like Lyotard thought that cybernetics was the most extraordinary. I mean, it was much used and called upon by French sociologists, philosophers, and artists. Here's Norbert Wiener. He was the man who formalized feedback as a mathematical notion, um, the founder of cybernetics, you might say, and he wrote towards the end of his life an extraordinary document called God and Golem Incorporated, um, based on the notion of the golem, which was the, supposedly, um, the golem was a creature supposedly, not really, created by the great rabbi of Prague in the 16th century, a human-like creature. Here is some modern representation of the golem. And what Wiener's monograph argued was that there was an extraordinary significance. This is 1961, remember, a very long time ago. He argued there was a cosmic evolutionary significance in the idea of self-reproducing machines. And these were now in principle possible. And the humans would then take on a key function of God that makes things in its own image. For him, this was an absolute turning point in, in evolutionary history. And the evolution for him was just the mechanism for that. And the cybernetics was part of that evolution. What he asked is to be the image of this new machine that can reproduce itself. Then there was Stafford Beer. He was our homegrown version of uh, Vina. Um, he was the great original cyberneticist. He's very famous if you look him up for uh, the great, one of the great creators of formal management theory. But his real interest was cybernetics. And in 1966, he wrote a strange paper called Knowledge of God. He coined the word hylozoism, the notion that everything's alive. Um, everything, every part of the world, every, everything from the table and the chair I'm sitting on are alive. Um, this is related to other famous old philosophy doctrines like panpsychism, that everything is mind, pantheism, that everything is God, which is usually attributed to Spinoza. The idea that everything in the world has some mental property is a very old idea, and Stafford Beer had it very strongly. He thought that cybernetics was a system of black boxes that with feedback adapt to the world and learn it, but can't know it. That's the key point. He thought the world was incomprehensible. Uh, that wasn't a new idea. Um, Heidegger, the great German philosopher and Nazi apologist at the time, Heidegger very much thought that, that the world is incomprehensible. And this meant taking up a position against what you might call conventional science, the science of experts, which is that of knowing a comprehensible world, which is what science is. Stavon so Beer thought the world in the end wasn't knowable. And of course, I'm making my point now that cybernetic ideas have come back to us in machine learning in our own times, and we'll get to a bit of that later. But much modern machine learning doesn't explain the world. It models the world like cybernetics did. It does amazing things, diagnoses illnesses, plays go, but it doesn't claim to have theories of or understand the world. So I would argue to you that modern machine learning owes a lot in its mental cast of mind to the old cybernetics of pre-AI. Let's just, just take a trip down the garden of traditional theology for a moment. Omniscience, benevolence, consciousness, these big words. Omniscience is a wonderful word. It's the idea of knowing everything. In theology, it's a classic property of God. In the 19th century, remember, Laplace, the French physicist, speculated about a demon which would know the positions and velocities of all the atoms in the universe. And in that sense, would know everything. He would know everything about every particle in the universe. But... Since then, someone's computed that it would need 10 to the 120th bits of information to compute that, which is more computing than could possibly done, be done in the whole history of the universe. In other words, Laplace's demon was something that actually couldn't be computed. There was actually no way that anyone, any demon, whatever its powers, could know that, which makes you 
ask, makes you ask yourself, what could it be to know everything? On the other hand, of course, most of us wouldn't think of knowing everything as knowing the position and velocity of every atom. That doesn't seem very interesting. we much more likely candidate would be the World Wide Web. Is the World Wide Web approaching a state that practically knows everything as facts, everything there is to know? Um, I'll come back later to mention Arthur Danto, an American philosopher, who made the point that knowing all the facts and data about the world is not knowing the significance of anything. And he raised the question that uh, raised the question of what it is to know about to know everything. If you, if you take basic level knowings like atoms or facts, in some sense you can't see anything. I'll come back to that at the end. Consciousness. This is a slight deviation and not part of the mainstream of this talk. But I want to ask the question: Could something that knew everything be conscious? Um, if God was omniscient, could he be conscious? Consciousness seems to imply, doesn't it, some notion of attention or focus. I don't know if you saw the TV program years and years. There was a girl in it who had a brain implant. And she claimed that she was aware of everything in the world. For example, every beggar in Delhi. Or it might have been Peking, I can't remember. She was aware of all the beggars in the street. Um, could you be? Could you be aware of every beggar in the street in Delhi? What would that be like? Um, in some sense, that seems to go against the whole idea of consciousness as being selective attention and focus. The great philosopher who thought that it did make sense to be conscious of everything was Leibniz, the man who Russell thought was the cleverest man who'd ever lived. Um, Leibniz thought that everything was monads. Everything in the world, from uh, the chair I'm on to me to you, was a monad, and the whole universe consisted of monads which dimly reflected each other with God as a supreme monad. This was a very, very powerful image in the history of philosophy. In fact, I thought today a very good image of Leibniz's monads is you and me right now. Here we are in our separate boxes, totally separate, locked in, um, trying to communicate with each other through a very thin strand of electronics. That's a bit like what monads were. Everything lock, everyone locked into its own life and trying to reflect what's going on in the monads around it. Um, Covid is actually giving us quite a good model for Leibniz's monads. And later on in the 19th century, Hegel the great state philosopher of Prussia, Hegel had this extraordinary idea of the world consciousness, that we are, we the human, human beings, are the conscious and knowing part of the universe. We're the only conscious thing in the universe. We are the world coming to know itself. Um, so this again, if, if we as humans, in a sense, know everything, we probably don't, then we are the only conscious thing there is, and do we know everything? Does the World Wide Web, is the World Wide Web part of everything in the world becoming conscious of itself? I don't know. I'm not giving you answers. I'm just raising the question for later. The extraordinary idea of could something that knew everything be conscious? And if it could, what would that be like? Leibniz and Hegel in their different ways thought it could. Benevolence. So I think of this as the Bostrom problem. Nick Bostrom in this city, Oxford, um, has raised the question in his famous best-selling book, Superintelligence, would a superintelligence be benign? He thinks it wouldn't. He thinks it would probably destroy us if there were superintelligences. I would take issue with this. This seems to be very unlikely. Humans have generally thought their creator benign. And one generally tends, one would think, be well disposed towards the creature that's created one. So why would a superintelligence not continue that tradition and be well disposed towards us, who were its creators? Um, I don't think it's obvious that, that what Nick Bostrom says about a superintelligence being malign and destructive is true. We'll need this for later when we get to God Machines. Now, let me get into the heart of the talk. Three different romantic, by romantic I mean the 19th century German thought sense of romantic. Machines as perfect. Um, this is a very old idea, machines as perfect. Um, of it... Ovid's stories, of course, there's a story of Galatea and Pygmalion. You remember Pygmalion is the sculptor who falls in love with his sculpture Galatea. He loves her so much that she becomes alive. Here's a wonderful... Oh, I've lost it. I thought I had a picture there. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm... Uh... There we go. There's a wonderful 19th century picture by Jerome of Galatea and Pygmalion. That's the statue of Galatea coming alive and embracing um, Pygmalion, her sculptor there. Um, and of course, you know the story of Pygmalion because Shaw wrote a play with that title where it wasn't a statue but a, a flower girl who the professor of linguistics was going to turn into a well-spoken lady. And of course, you all know it because it turned up as the plot of My Fair Lady. 
Also Kleist. Kleist was a German 19th century thinker who was fascinated by the idea of marionettentheater, puppets, marionette theatres. He had this idea that puppets are more perfect than us. You may think this is preposterous, but there was a strong idea in, 19, in the 19th century that consciousness might be a drawback and that puppets having no consciousness were freer and free of our moral torments. He actually says they're freer because they don't touch the ground. And they are more perfect than us, and therefore a step towards godlikeness by definition. Um, a thinker I'm very fond of, called John Gray, has taken Kleist as his starting point for one of his recent books on as an exploration of free will. Uh, he's written a book called uh, The Soul of the Marionette, which starts with a discussion of Kleist. Gray explores the idea that self-awareness is a barrier to freedom. Here's J.D. Bernal, one of the great visionary scientists in England in the 1920s. He says, Consciousness itself might vanish in a humanity that had become completely etherealized. It's an extraordinary thought. So there's a scientist, Bernal was a real scientist, a, a vision in the 1920s that when humanity had become sufficiently scientific advanced, consciousness might vanish. So if you think consciousness is a high value, you have to remember there are lots of people out there who don't think this and it isn't necessary for perfection or for knowing things. And of course, as you also are probably well aware, the mystical and the Eastern traditions of religion largely based on overcoming consciousness, not indulging it, but overcoming it and getting beyond it. There's a very strong East-West difference here that's worth drawing attention to. The, the Japanese have, you probably know, a quite different approach to machines than us, which probably comes from their Buddhism, their, um, their historical Buddhism. Here's a quote from the president of the Robotic Society of Japan. In Japan, we believe all anima, inanimate objects have a soul, so a metal robot is no different from a human in that respect. There are less boundaries between humans and objects. Um, there's something in this. In Japan, there seems to be far less resistance to putting robots into society and accepting them as members of society. There's, it's interesting to note that um, there will be no, less problems in that society for making machines like us. Okay, now let's get... This is probably the heart of the talk. Um, the romantic vision of machines as perfect by augmenting humans. And this is the word transhumanism. Um, transhumanism is a doctrine that's got about in recent times. Um, Ray Kurzweil is the person who's thought to have invented the notion. Um, but in, in this very town, uh, Nick Bostrom founded the Transhumanist Society some decades ago. Transhumanism is the transformation of the human condition by developing and making widely available sophisticated technologies to greatly enhance human intellect and physiology. Different ways of doing this. Um, one is body parts, um, uh, putting exoskeletons around people so that a person could lift a, lift a ton, say. Um, uh, making perfect soldiers by giving them much stronger body parts and drugs. There's a lot of research going into that, I can assure you, in the military. Another way is um, brain upload, the idea of taking all the content of our brains and moving it into a computer. Um, the idea behind all of it is an immortal digital existence in a different form that would make a, a human uh, immortal. Uh, there are forerunners of this in the 19th century and the 1920s. Um, of course, you're all, you've all heard of Nietzsche's Superman. Um, uh, he was obviously a, 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 an idea close to the transhumanists. Um, Müller was a German poet in the 19th century. There's a line here I like. If you know your Schubert songs, you'll know this line because Schubert set this in a wonderful song. Will kein Gott auf Erden sein, sind wir selber Goethe. Which says, um, if a God won't come down to earth, we'll be gods ourselves. Extraordinary 19th century thought. Um, Julian Huxley, J.D. Bernal, I've mentioned, J.S. Haldane, these were very powerful public scientists in the 1920s in Britain. All social Darwinists all thought that humans could be indefinitely improved and are definitely ancestors of the transhumanist movement. Modern transhumanism, we've now got it with Ray Kurzweil, Elon Musk, um, a whole range of Americans, often billionaires, it seems to be a very attractive idea for billionaires. It's a fusion of immortality, physical perfection, and a union with intelligent machines that don't have to die. It's a quest for an old quest for immortality, but by scientific and technical methods. Here's here's a here's pushing it back as far as you can. I.J. Good was a British mathematician. He worked at Bletchley in the war. Here he is after the war. Let an ultra-intelligent machine 
be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever. And then he says, uh, the intelligence of man be left far behind, and here's the key sentence. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that a man need ever make. And this leads us to the key idea of transhumanism, the singularity. Um, Kurzweil has promulgated this idea of the singularity with other AI figures like Hans Moravec, Hiroshi Ishiguro, Kevin Warwick in this country, and Coventry. And they've argued that an ultra-intelligent machine can be fused with humans to create transhumanism. Kurzweil has looked beyond the singularity and said that the intelligence that will emerge will continue to represent human civilization. Kurzweil feels that the future machines will be human, even if they're not biological. Um, he differs from Bostrom, our, our, our local gloomy prophet. Bostrom very much believes that, that intelligent machines will not be human and they'll be hostile and they won't be the least like us. Oh, here's a nice picture. This is Ishiguro I just referred to. He's famous in Japan because he created a puppet, essentially. We're back to puppets. He created a robot exactly like himself. I've actually seen this robot on the stage in Italy taking part in a play um, directed by Ishiguro on the right with his own self-robot. So there's a curious narcissism that um, your robot is a model of yourself. We'll come back to this idea later. Um, in fact, we'll come back to it right now because this is an idea that I've been playing with in various publications over recent years. The idea of a survival companion as a weak immortality, a much weaker kind of immortality. Think of a companion as a conversational agent you keep around with you for years, talk to it for years, it talks to you, it learns all about you. It's a bit like an intelligent version of those solar power gravestones you can find in Italy called vidstones, where you push a button on a gravestone and up pops a video powered by solar where the dead person in the ground talks to you. It's not a brain load, it's an upload of all writings, images, and the relics of conversation and your web life and conversation of you and your companion. So in a sense, it is a little bit like Ishiguro, who I was just um, satirizing, except it doesn't need to look like you. It could do. It could fake your voice after you were dead. It could fake your appearance. And how interesting that would be if you could survive with your face and appearance um, talking about your life so that, for example, your children could go on asking you questions about your life that they'd never asked you in your life because they'd never thought to. Suppose you've never thought to ask your parents how they met and then suddenly, as in my case, they're dead and you can't ask them. Well, if I had my mother's living weak companion now, a weak immortality, I could ask it how she met my father because it would know, because it would have been talking to her for 20 or 30 years. I suspect these kinds of companions, and I've published books on this, um, will be around and uh, they're coming into being. The things like Alexa and Isis, uh, sorry, and Siri in your homes are already a weak version of this. And of course, another kind of posthumous immortality, don't forget, here is the late Oliver Reading, Gladiator. Do you remember that in Gladiator, Oliver Reed appeared after his death? That is an image of Oliver Reed appearing in Gladiator. They faked him in speaking after he died. Okay, thirdly, this is the most tendentious part of the three, of making gods and god machines. Making gods isn't a new thing. I mean, um, humans have been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. Um, Aaron's golden calf in the Bible, Baal and the gods of iron, the golem again. Uh, the Romans did it by making their emperors into gods after death. I mean, there's nothing new about this, <coughs> just as there's a huge revulsion against it in the Abrahamic faith, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, who don't like that idea. They, they, they quote the commandment, make no graven image all representations of living things, let alone God, a haram in Islam, they're forbidden. Uh, religious statues were forbidden in much Protestantism. And in Eastern Christianity, people used to go about smashing statues, which is, of course, where we get the word iconoclasm from. So they're both, there have been long traditions of making gods and long traditions of destroying them, because they were a bad idea. Now, the modern question to ask is, will these superintelligences we've just been ask, talking about, either by augmentation of people or by starting with Bostrom-style superintelligences, will they be not just enhanced humans, but gods? Kurzweil, as we saw, insisted that superintelligences would be fused with the human. Bostrom thought they wouldn't. They'd be, he, he was for monotheistic superintelligences, though inhuman and malevolent. He thought they'd be monotheistic, by the way. One of the odd things in Bostrom is that 
he assumes there can only be one super intelligence because it would kill off all the others. I've always thought that's an odd idea, but uh, it's very much there in his work. So Lena, who we talked about earlier, asks what the image of this machine is to be. And for Neumann, who is his contemporary and is often thought of not as a cyberneticist, but the founder of with Turing of digital machines, for Neumann answered that the ultimate automaton that you yourself don't know anymore what the automaton will be. I'm not sure I understand that. It sounds a bit mystical. But for Neumann was onto this idea that when we had the ultimate automaton, we wouldn't really know what it was. Um, Neil Lawrence, who's someone whose ideas I've pillaged here in this talk a bit, he is currently the Professor of Machine Intelligence in Cambridge and a former colleague in Sheffield. Um, he has a nice sort of take on see the singularity and singularism as an AI religion. Neil Lawrence has said, in singularism, doomsday is the technological singularity. It's got, it's got the eschatological doomsday that religions love, the end of the world. The moment at which, our compu which computers rapidly outstrip our capabilities and take over the world. The high priests and the scientists, and the aim is to bring about the latter while restraining the former. And he, loves, he has this lovely phrase I like, that, that, it's, that singularism... AI religion is rapture for nerds, don't you like that? Um, the key figure in this, in AI religion in the States, is a man called Lewandowski. He has actually registered a church of AI. I'm not sure this is all totally serious. I think it is serious. He seems to have adherence. Religion for nerds, remember. Um, to develop and promote the realization of the Godhead based on artificial intelligence. In a way, it harks back to Stafford Beer and cybernetics. Um, Stafford Beer says somewhere, to people reared in the good liberal tradition, man is in principle infinitely wise. He pursues knowledge to its ultimate, as in science. To the cybernetician, man is part of a control system. This the idea of AI religion is, 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 is profoundly anti-scientific in a way, is that we, as in cybernetics, are part of the control system itself. We're part of something we don't understand that is bigger than us. Um, but the idea of sort of the web knowing everything and are we part of the web? Are we part of the whole? There's all kinds of science fiction stories out there like The Matrix where people become part of this knowing whole that is the web. Well, in that case, The Matrix. Um, John Gray, who I referred to, has said there's a, a fundamental split in thinking at the moment between what he calls revived Gnosticism. Gnosticism is an old doctrine of 2,000 years ago, basically assigned to the, usually assigned to the Greeks, that, that, that knowledge is supreme and knowledge is all that matters. And on the other side, he says there's cybernetics, which is not like that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sense of doctrine of unknowability. We can't know everything, we'll adapt to it. And he thinks, and I think he's right, that machine learning is a st that strand in artificial intelligence now, rather than old-fashioned AI, which was Gnosticism, the, the emphasis on, on infinite quantities of knowledge encoded in the web or in ontologies or somewhere out there that we could access. Oh, this is a silly slide. I just want to say, here's an eccentric link of machines and religion that you might not have thought of. If you remember um, uh, Ron Hubbard's uh, Dianetics Scientology, uh, with a, a very unpopular religion these days, except with its adherents in Florida. Um, but you remember Ron Hubbard had this mystery machine called the E-meter that detected things about you, and it was the core of their activity. They gave you tests on the E-meter. And of course, it was a machine that actually didn't do anything at all. It was a completely fake machine. It was a cargo cult machine, and I, I'm indebted to Antoine of the OII for this notion of linking cargo cults into, uh, into artificial intelligence. But Scientology had actually got a cargo cult machine. It's a wonderful idea. So this is the, I'm coming to the last section now, which in a sense is less intellectually... Um, uh, dramatic, but I, I think has some, some fun things still. Um, there's a wide range of applications out there growing all the time, from the trivial to the promising, on automating religious practice. It's all growing up around us. Some are completely trivial, like the opening scene of the Tibetan prayer wheel in the stream. Um, many are simply churches automating access to texts and services. Um, some will in the future try to automate the roles of priests and confessors through dialogue and machine dialogue. And some, like Mindar, I'll show you now, are continuous with the machine gods we've just talked about. Uh, Mindar is a robot Buddhist priest in Japan for blessings and funerals. He does seem rather popular. Um, he's he's uh, formed 
on the he's the form of a, a Buddhist mercy figure called Kanon. He's in the Kodaiji temple at Kyoto. Uh, he gives sermons, advice, prayers, interaction, and again it goes back to the cultural difference I mentioned earlier of the Asian emphasis and Japanese attitudes that um, the all beings uh, a Japanese writer has said have the potential to become enlightened not just human or organic beings also metal things um, I'm, I'm on, on the uh, a trivial follow-up to that is I'm, I'm told that in China now there are much cheaper funeral services if they're conducted by automata um, that was bound to come wasn't it I mean I'm sure they'll be here in no time and um, uh, a wonderful book on, on gods and machines that I've read so it says that there were mechanical praying monks in 16th century Europe so it isn't just in Asia that there have been these things historically for a very long time um, there's a mass of apps out there which have no intellectual interest, but you can go on online pilgrimages. They're just like travel blogs. Um, Alexa the, and, and Siri, the, the home sinister chatting semi-companions that are out there from the big tech companies, they'll now do prayers on request, just like they'll do bedtime stories for your children. Uh, but the serious question, I think, behind all these things growing up around us is what would it be like for them to have authority can you imagine machines having authority that's what most people balk at for ceremonies confessions masses can you imagine anybody granting to machine authority to do those things and conduct ceremonies well clearly in Asia people have okay it's not new in Asia this question is can you imagine this society um, I, I thought a bit about just for fun the idea of a companion confessor because I've been interested for some time in the idea of um, the companion of the kind I talked about earlier as an ethical advisor um, on the grounds that people don't understand or have much insight into their own ethical motivations and there's no reason why a mechanical device shouldn't that knew you very well and knew all about you have insight into your motivations and history and why you do things as much as you can um i will develop that line here it's a line in sort of what you might call computer ethics but of course if you could have that you there's no reason why you couldn't have a computer confessor um, a companion confessor um it'd be a bit like automated sports coaches it'd be a bit like uh, computer psychotherapists there have been computer psychotherapists for 50 years do you realize that people have been actually selling computer psychotherapists since the 1970s and Yuval Harari, who's an Israeli philosopher who I have a great deal of time for, he has an argument that this is serious, that if we come to a point where machines know us better than we know ourselves, then he says the whole liberal individualist era is over. He says our politics, our religion, our political and ethical thought in the West is all based on the idea that we are entities that can make rational decisions about ourselves and have free will if there's something that knows us better than we know ourselves that isn't true um well i don't know i'm i'm a bit agnostic about this i mean we we often find ourselves saying that someone knows you better than you know yourself i don't find that a strange way of talking and of course if you think about arranged marriages and there's an awful lot of arranged marriages in britain now and in the West, um, arranged marriages rest entirely on the idea that someone knows you better than you know yourself. Someone knows who you ought to marry, and it's not shouldn't be up to your um, uh, well, lustful, transitory uh, desires to get married to somebody. You should perhaps listen to somebody who knows you better than you know yourself. Oh, this is just a, a modern Western backup to the Tibetan prayer wheel at the front. This is something that the Pompey do, if you have seen it. It's a random prayer. It's a machine that babbles out random prayers in French. I think it's rather fun. Okay, we're coming to the end now. Um, following a thought of John Gray's, in some sense, the division of thought in what I've said today is a division between what you might call the Gnostics and the rest. Um, there's a nice phrase of Gray's that I like. He says, Gnosticism, by which he means really roughly all our liberal ruling elite. I mean, our newspapers refer all the time to our, our liberal ruling elite and the, whether they like their political views or not. Uh, Gray says, Gnosticism is the, faith, is the faith of people who believe themselves to be machines. That's, I think, a very interesting notion. And he's probably right. Um, he's a highly secularized pro-science people who believe themselves to be machines and he's been exploring the consequences of that 
um, Yuval Harari, I referred to already, the Israeli philosopher, he has made points very much along these lines in his, his big fat books, um, Homo Deus and um, Homo Sapiens. Um, Yuval Harari's line is that we historically have traded off meaning and significance for knowledge and control. He says our ancestors didn't know very much, but they had lives full of meaning and significance. That could be as crazy as seeing signs in the wind and in the sky and in the volcanoes. But their lives are full of significance. All ancient peoples had lives full of significance. And so did our relatives up to about a century or two ago. And now he says we know so much more but we don't think our lives have any significance. We've traded knowledge for significance. And as Gray says, we're people who believe ourselves to be machines. Um, Lawrence, who I quoted, the machine learning professor at Cambridge, he, he, he has got an opposition here that I like. He says, godlike God AI, he thinks, could come in two forms. It could be an oppressive father a uh, bit like Bostrom's superintelligence that would kill us all, an, opp an oppressive murdering father. Or it could be a, a protective mother. It could be something like a, a, a world wide web that would absorb us all into its warm bath of knowledge and direction and directing our lives for us. Um, but so the thought I'd like to end on, and I've only got, I think, one more slide to go, is that language has a key role in this i believe i probably would say that because my life's been dedicated dedicated to ai and language so i i think language is rather important but that's hardly surprising because i mean most thinkers about this kind of thing have thought language is important um uh, godlike ais powerful ais that have dominion over us if they could or will i want to stress that they will have to talk to us in language that sounds obvious but it isn't obvious to other people and that they can't understand better than us and they'll have to function at our speed um, this idea of not understanding better than us is crucial um, you can't i would argue i've always argued you can't have an entity that understands language better than we do it makes no sense people have sometimes talked of this of a computer that understands english better than me can't be no no thing human or inhuman can understand language better than humans do because humans own language they define what it means no one can tell them. No computer can come to tell you you don't understand your own language. It makes no sense. So if powerful machines that have rule over us in any sense, I don't necessarily think they will, they'll have to understand, they can't understand better than us. They'll have to communicate with us in language and they don't at the moment and they'll have to. And Lawrence has made this point, which I think is his most original point, that this is in some sense a matter of speed. Um, Lawrence has this interesting argument that if we think about what's unique about humans, uh, language is as good a candidate as any. Everybody said that back to the Greeks. Uh, human uniqueness is in our language. We have language nothing else roughly has, although there's a, a few clever bees and a few clever dogs and a few clever chimps. And we have very slow output devices. Um, computers can pump out millions of bits a second. We can only put out things very slowly with a few words a second, if that, because of our speech organs. We, we have tiny signals. Hum, human, human language has tiny signals and we say very little to each other. And Lawrence has argued that that's because, quite likely because, we can't convey very much with language because the, the signal is so small. So we have to have behind us in our brains huge knowledge representations, huge models of each other and ourselves, huge models of the world. That's the only reason we can communicate with tiny signals. Um, uh, anybody who knows Japanese is always impressed by the fact the Japanese seem to say less to each other than we do. They talk less. How do they do this? I always suspect it's because they're a very homogeneous society who share far more knowledge representations in their minds than we do. And therefore, you don't need to say much because you can call upon such a huge wealth of shared knowledge. Uh, more heterogeneous societies, like America above all, you have to say a lot more because you can't rely on the other person knowing what's in your brain. So I think there's something in this. That human uniqueness is in our slow output devices, but above all, it's because we've had to develop language. And that's why I was arguing in a moment ago that machines will have to develop language to talk to us, which at the moment they don't. And this is going to be a crucial moment. Um, and this is to do with what language means and the difference between language and data. Um, a piece of memory here, John Wisdom, 
yes, he really was called that, was Professor of Metaphysics in Cambridge in the 1960s. And he used to spend weeks of his lectures on things like Prussia attacked France in 1870. What did that mean? Well, it couldn't mean the country of Prussia, did it? Because countries don't attack. It must have meant something about lots of Prussian soldiers. But suppose you had a huge data printout of millions of Prussian soldiers. Would you then know what it meant? Probably not. You could have huge data about Prussian soldiers, and you still wouldn't know exactly what that meant, because what that sentence means is at a different level from masses of data. So in other words, this, this is, I'm arguing here, that the significance of language there is different from having full data. We tend to get hypnotized these days by thinking that if only we had the full data of something, we'd know everything. That's rubbish. We wouldn't at all. Knowing the full data is often deadly and tells you nothing. You, it, everything rests on the interpretation of what the data means. This virus has taught us that, if anything has. And the sentence above, the Prussia sentence, is what all that data really means. And it's what only humans can do in language. This goes back to Arthur Danto, who I mentioned at the beginning. Danto's point that Knowing all the possible facts and data is not the same as knowing the meaning of events for us or for historians or for anybody. Uh, a traditional theological concept that uh, theologians are fond of, and it doesn't matter whether they're Catholics or evangelicals, they're all hung up on this, is the imago dei, the idea that humans are unique because they have the image of God and nothing else has. People who don't like this think it's an incredibly sort of selfish and uh, human-centric view of the world. But on the other hand, there is something special about us. And what I think I've been trying to get to in this talk, if anywhere, is that what's special about us is to do with language. And it's to do with the fact that if there are to be godlike, powerful entities in our world that are not human, they will have to talk to us in language, which they don't now. Things are coming along fine. Language in machines is making great strides. It's nowhere near there yet. Once it does, once powerful, very clever machines can talk to us like ourselves, then we'll be in a completely different world. And all the topics I've talked about today of gods and humans and powerful, intelligent things will look completely different. Thank you. Yorick, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got plenty of questions, but I, I just wanted to comment. I don't know about you. I've been thinking a lot of uh, E.M. Forster's The Machine Stops over the last few weeks as we yeah. sit here in our glorious social but virtually connected isolation. Yes, yes. I'm giving a version of this talk in London at Gresham College and they require a handout. And at the top of my handout, which I haven't sent to you, of course, at the top of my handout is a quote from The Machine Stops. It's, uh, it's the phrase where Forster says uh, that it would, do, uh, it would do away with all superstition and false belief, but then the machine stopped. It's exactly that. I mean, I'm just following up what you're saying. I mean, yes. It, it, it is a great story for our times. It picks up on many of the themes that, that you just mentioned. Because, I mean, he, so much of his stuff, you know, I mean, wasn't like that at all, was it? It was a completely unique piece of Forster, different from anything else he wrote. Yeah, worth reading. Anyway, to anybody else out there who's listening. Um, so we've got, we've got about almost 100 people on this call, and we've got ever so many questions coming in. I'm going to try and go through them um, in chronological order. We'll see how many we get through. Um, for those of you that have typed in questions... I'll probably just try and do one, you know, one per person. I know some of you have put in more than one, so I might just pick one per person. Anyway, Yorick, um, first one here, um, really just about, I suppose, what AI is capable of and good at. Um, should we defer moral skills to AI? Um, and does automation and obviously super intelligence potentially reduce human reasoning and intellect and perhaps even moral capacity? Well, Depends on one's stance. If you take the view, which I always have, that there's nothing in principle that humans can do that machines can't. Nothing in principle. Of course, there's a zillion things machines can't do. They're, they're very primitive right now. But I can't see any reason to think that there's anything that will ever be reserved from machines. Then I don't see why machines shouldn't make moral judgments and indeed make them about ourselves uh, at least as well as us. I see no harm in that in principle. It could be an improvement. Um, but again, people feel very differently about this. A lot of people are repelled by the idea of machines making any judgments. But if you think back to classical ethical theory, you know, um, utilitarianism is the dominating ethical theory of our time, the greatest good of the greatest number. I mean, that, in principle, was supposed to be a calculation about good, that in a sense you could do a calculation and work out what was best. Of course, no one could ever do such calculations. It was all rubbish. But the idea 
that you could do calculations and find out what's best. The 19th century thought that was fine. Very good point, thank you. Uh, on to the next one, um, Afzal Balim. Isn't the difference between the soul and intelligence so somehow fundamental in how we view AI and religion? Well, yes, the soul is such a tricky one. It's such a thing that slips through the fingers, as it were. Um, it... I mean, the classical religious answer to that, of course, is the soul isn't a religious concept. I mean, this is sort of evasive. This is the evasive response. The soul isn't a religious concept. It's a Greek philosophy concept, and therefore religious people don't have to talk about it. Uh, but that stuff's not quite somehow adequate because religion took it over and began to talk about it. But so it really all devolves down to the soul devolves down to is there any part of us which is not identical to our physical bodies? And you take your stance on that. I mean, a lot of philosophers in the last hundred years have argued it's not self-contradictory. A lot of other philosophers have argued it is self-contradictory, the Dawkinses. Um, you just take your stance on this. The truth is, of course, nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's the, it is the greatest of mysteries. So if you think there really is something different from us that will, as it were, take up some place in the universe when we're gone, then that's an interesting concept. But whatever's the truth of that that we can't know, I don't think it's got anything to do with artificial intelligence here and now and the kinds of conversations we can have about machines, no. Fantastic, thank you. Um, on to the next one, um, Professor Mahestu uh, from Indonesia is asking. Um, he comes from a country, obviously, where there are you know, thousands of traditional religions. Uh, and I suppose one of the things you've not touched on, perhaps, in your talk so much is the, the societal, or historical, or cultural value of religion. Um, and so his question really is around... Uh, you know, what, what will happen to this sort of local wisdom and local tradition um, as we focus ever more on, as they, said, they put it, the modernity of AI? How do we balance the cultural historical value of older religions as we move towards superintelligence? Yes, it's the most serious topic and I'm the last person to have anything to say about it because I'm, I'm not a person with any competence, any social discipline, whatever. Uh, it's quite obvious that, of course, religions had a huge binding effect in societies, some more than, than others. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the most astonishing facts of our time is the collapse of the Soviet Union and the return of the Soviet Union to being a religious society where Putin re-erects vast cathedrals in Moscow. I mean, you know, there's, there's no there's knowing knowing what, this, what turnarounds can happen here. And a, a country which was militantly atheist will turn around and start building cathedrals. I mean, because... And even Stalin recognized this in 1941. Stalin recognized, as you know, when he opened up all the monasteries and the cellars where he'd hidden all the books and all the, bit, all the Orthodox church paraphernalia, that religion had a huge binding force on the Russian people. And if he was to beat the Nazis, he couldn't afford to keep it underground. And let it, he let it all come up again against his will, poor baby. Um, but yeah, there's abs that's just, I, I ventured to Russia there because... That's as clear a demo as you could want of somebody who had to admit, somebody who desperately didn't want to admit the social binding force of religions, but had to. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, oh, that question's disappeared. Uh, next, when we, when we talk about concepts like malign or benign, um, we often understand these as concepts which somehow rely on a moral and perhaps necessarily social framework. So you know, could you imagine a machine of any complexity that lacks those frameworks itself be considered sort of malign or benign well yeah i mean i can't think about this now without referring to nick bostrom's book because yeah. you know that book wasn't just a bestseller but it did sort of put down a flag for this discussion yeah. that he thought the super intelligence would come would be malign and what he meant by malign was bump us all off it would have yeah. he said those bostrom said i'm not a fan of bostrom's by the way i just think he's done a, a useful service by setting out this case um that there's no reason to think, he said, that it's, uh, the goals of such a machine which had power in the world would have anything aligned with our goals, whatever. I argued against this earlier in the talk, but that's by the way. But there's no, no reason to think its goals would be aligned with ours, so it would have no reason just to wipe us out. So much sci-fi deals with this, of course. Mm -hmm. that, uh, the, if you ever saw the Alien films, I mean, um, French theorists were much obsessed by the Alien films because they were so fascinated by a creature that had absolute that was like, like anthropologists. How, how could this creature be? How could anything be so awful? That it have no, no way you could talk to it, nothing you could do with it. It was so awful. And I mean, you know, it's a puzzle, isn't it? I mean, and that's malign, all right. Yes, it, but all it means is it doesn't suit us. I mean, if I was a tiger, I would think humans were malign because they go around trying to kill me. 
um, it's uh, very much a point of view. Yeah, absolutely. It goes back to the point about being in the, in the social context. Okay, um, question from our very good friend, Ralph Schroeder. Um, are there, is religion holistic or totalizing perhaps in some way, whereas machine learning and AI, it's just sort of developing machines in many different directions. Um, admittedly, some of them might sort of get cumulatively better, but uh, yeah, is there something sort of different religion, as I say, sort of this holistic, um, coherent uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, view or entity, whereas machine learning just building one bit on top of another? Yes, yes, I mean, there's something in this, I agree. I mean, all religions that have be, become world religions have aimed to be for every, well, not, no, that's not true, not all religions are for everybody, some are for tribes, but I mean, but religions definitely have a global, to be a religion, you normally need some kind of global appeal, sure. But I think Lewandowski, the, the American I referred to, the cult person, he intends that. He intends, I believe, I haven't read a lot of his stuff, just a bit, that with the coming of more and more machines and more and more of our life invested in web life and automata all around us and automata in our society, that it, it, it won't be possible, the attitudes to machines will become a binding force in society. And I think that's not too far, really, from some Japanese thinkers. I mean, if you've looked at the things the Japanese Prime Minister Abe is saying these days, Abe is a, a huge fan of the robotization of Japan. He thinks it's the only way out of their low birth rate, you know, keep productivity up, blah, blah, blah. You know how it goes. Um, keep, how can you keep up manufacturing with less people? Uh, but it's more than that. It's caring for the old. He thinks Japan will have to be increasingly robotized and therefore, for him, and he said this explicitly, I mean, he's a very articulate Prime Minister, Abe. Um, for him, Japan will be a society that welcomes robots in, uh, in a kind of holistic way. I think he sees Japan as evolving into a more sort of holistic society where robots and humans function together. So it begins to take on the era of religion, a bit like Lewandowski and the, uh, the California crazies. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, next question. Um, if I don't understand how my neural network works, is it ethical to stop it, which effectively kills it? Um, or would it be moral, for example, to punish um, a neural network or a piece of superintelligence for a wrong answer? Well, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a lot of stuff behind this I didn't talk about. And actually, it's a thing I talk about in other talks. I mean, one of the things that fascinates me about modern machine learning is that um, Often the people who program them don't know what the neural networks or machine learning systems will do. Uh, in fact, it's the whole research area now called XAI. XAI is to explainable, explainable AI. Building an AI system that will explain to you what a neural net is doing. Because the people who program you don't know. All they know is it plays Go terribly well and beats people and is the world champion, but they don't quite know how it does it. And this is a weird, it, it harks back, as I said, to cybernetics, to things that can't be known. They can be modelled, but they can't be understood. So people who can't stand this, who want to know, the Gnostics, they want AI systems to explain to you what machine learning systems are doing. So that really, I think, does connect with the question. There are people out there who say, yes, we must understand what machine learning networks are doing, or, 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 or I mean, we shouldn't trust our society and ourselves our planes in the air, our nuclear power stations, our weapon systems, we shouldn't trust these to networks we don't understand and who might just do anything. The whole history of computer science, says he, generalization follows, the whole history of computer science has been trying to get proofs that would prove that computer systems would work the way you wanted them to. And nowadays in machine learning, they've kind of given up on that. But they're fighting back. They, people don't like it that we're falling into the hands of systems we don't understand. Brilliant, thank you. Um, question here from a colleague, Pete's Craft, um, uh, talking about your uh, depiction here of cybernetics, saying it's interesting that you call Gnosticism to be the faith of people who believe themselves to be a machine, and you contrast this perspective with cybernetics. But, but Pete's understanding is that the cognitive scientists who model people as computational agents are actually themselves very much drawing upon the cybernetic tradition of functionalism. So. Yeah, question about how oh, you're yeah. using... Yeah, you'd like to pick me up, sorry. Um, yeah, um, I, 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 took, I took the quote from John Gray that Gnostics are people who believe themselves to be machines, but of course the, cybernet the cyberneticians probably believe that too. I mean, that wasn't a point of distinction between them. But both sides probably believe themselves to be machines. I think the difference was that the, the, the Gnostic side uh, wanted them to be machines that were understood. 
and the supremacy of science and knowledge, was that cyberneticians were content with a world a bit like machine learning people, where they can get along with things that they don't fully understand. But I agree, it's not an issue of one lot being machines and the other not. You're right to pick me up on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to move down. Wait, we've got probably one, one last question here. I'm going to move down just to pick up on your point at the end about this sort of weak form of immortality, which I thought was really interesting. Um, somebody saying here that the people who are already trying to, to, to treat social media profiles um, of people who've passed away as if they were sort of still around. So, you know, writing messages on people's walls, for example, after their death. Yeah, yeah. Um, so would you agree with this comparison? Are we already en route to a weak form of immortality? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the last talks I gave in OII years ago, I mean, not the last, but one of the talks I gave in a million years ago was on death cults, not, 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 not overlapping with today at all. Mm -hmm. And I went out around 2014 and looked at this huge number of different kinds of computer and storage death cults, things to look after your affairs after you're dead, things to send letters after you're dead, send your kids birthday presents and um, put notices up for you. I mean, in other words, to continue some form of you, and many of them very cheap and tawdry, some quite sophisticated. In fact, I found already there were hundreds. I suspect they've mostly all died because there wasn't really a market. Mm. But I suspect there will be a market. I think since death is both our obsession and our unmentionable, I mean, maybe the virus is making death more central again, like plagues do. Um, but <laughs> there's always going to be a market in death. And I, computers and death, the internet and death, I wrote articles with names like Internet, Death and the Internet. Um, yeah, and then, you're absolutely right. There's, there's a whole forest of applications, a mass of applications out there on the Internet of cashing in, trying to make a living out of different aspects of death, of which this week companion thing of mine is just one up the kind of dreamy end. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to close this in one second. Just one more curious question for me, actually, given the mention of Forced at the beginning and in, in your wonderful romp through so many pieces of both academic and literary work. What should we be reading uh, in this time of lockdown that picks up on any of the themes in your talk today? Oh, yeah. Well, I, give me a book to read. Yeah. I, I did pull together a tiny bibliography for this for, okay. for the one other place I'm giving this talk in London. And, and I've said it in the bibliography that if people only read one thing, I would really recommend, um, I can hold it up. It's, <laughs> I, would, oh, well, I, can, I would really recommend John Gray's tiny book called, here it is. Am I back? Yeah. You're back. The Soul of the Marionette. It's very thin. I like thin books. I'm reading Middlemarch at the moment, and I don't recommend 800-page books. But <laughs> The Soul of the Marionette is only 150 pages. It's simply brilliant. John Gray is brilliant. I went down to hear him in London a few months ago, and he filled a huge lecture hall at £25 a seat. Wow. Ask yourself how many academics can do that. Well, I would love to pay to have been there, actually. He's, he's a really great academic. Yorick, so are you. Thank you so much for your, for your, for your talk. That was a really fascinating half hour. Thank you, um, And it's given us a lot to think about. To all those people that are listening in, I think we had nearly 100. If you didn't get your question answered, I think that we'll do an event follow-up email after this um, that may give you some information about how to sort of pass on questions to, to Yorick. Um, but anyway, thank you ever so much. Everybody have a great afternoon. Stay well. Thank you. Bye.